Hello and welcome to the fourth and final masterclass for open call artists for the world reimagine. I am Ashley Shaw Scott Ajay, and I am thrilled to have you here as the artistic director of the world reimagine. So um, tonight is a very special um, night for um, for the world reimagined and our two extraordinary guests, the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin and our co-founder, Michelle Gale. So we are um, looking forward to, uh, to having them on the, the um, session today. And I, we will be talking about our shared history and our collective strength. And we will also be moving through the journey of discovery themes and exploring them and um, really engaging you, the artists, on how to uh, illustrate and how to bring these themes and ideas and concepts to life. So before we dive into this conversation, let me start with a poem by Maya Angelou called Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes spring high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? <laughs> Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't take it awful hard because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts, of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. So that poem for me just encapsulates so much of the emotion and the pride and the pain and the joy of um, the experience of the descendant of enslaved people. So um, something to think about as you artists are working through the um, body of research that there is on the transatlantic slave trade. Please go mine in different places, look in poetry, look in music, look in, in unexpected places. It doesn't just have to be textbook learning, what we're trying to bring to life is this extraordinary story. And so I invite you to, to search in many different places. Um, on that note, I would like to welcome my two guests, uh, Right Reverend Rose and Michelle, please come and join me. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Welcome ladies. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to see your faces. For my audience um, and my guests, um, 
Right Reverend Rose is the first Black female Church of England bishop, which is among many, many other talents and skills and glories, but something that I have to highlight in, in her introduction. And our co-founder, Michelle Gale, has had an extraordinary career in acting and in music, and she is currently on stage at in the West Inn in Harry Potter. So we're very proud um, of both of you and everything that you bring to the world reimagine. Uh, Rose is one of our patrons. So before we dive into our conversation, I just want to make sure that we go back to our nine journey of discovery themes which we will be circulating throughout this talk. Um, we have Mother Africa, the reality of being enslaved, stolen legacy, the rebirth of a nation, abolition and emancipation, a complex triangle, echoes in the present, still we rise, expanding soul, and reimagine the future. So all of these can be, again, found on our website, uh, www.theworldreimagined.org. And as we go through this discussion now, audience members, please go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and send in your questions. We will have a Q&A towards the end of our, our conversation. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. And we are here to share our personal stories using the framework of the journey of discovery. So before um, a, we get uh, too deep into the weeds of the journey of discovery, I first want to ask Michelle, our first masterclass was with our co-founder, Dennis Marcus, and he talked to us about his reason for wanting to move this idea forward and what the world reimagined means to him. And I'd love to hear from you, your perspective, because you two have wildly different backgrounds, but still felt that this was a shared history. Yes, I still remember that first conversation with Dennis because, um, you know, it's something that black people in the family and, and everyone speak about, you know, the fact that British people have not owned slavery, have not, have not really admitted how much money uh, was made from slavery, how cities were built off the back of slavery. It's something that my friends and family always spoke about. It was almost kept amongst black people. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and then, um, so sitting beside Dennis, and he says to me, you know, I really think Britain has an owned slavery. So that's when you're looking around going, is this a trap? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> because I just had never met a white guy say that to me before. That's, that's the bottom line of it. Um, and so he explains his background that he was from South Africa and his dad had, had worked with Nelson Mandela and he's also half German. And so they're two, um, nations have had to have a reckoning and have had to have truth and reconciliation of, of some some sort and he said it always struck him that Britain hasn't really done that bit and it, it and like I said it struck a chord with me because we always say you know we always go Britain always says oh we ended slavery you know William Wilberforce we're so civilized and they kind of negate everything that went before how much money was made the repercussions of slavery that we still see today and I felt how could we have this conversation? It's really good to have a conversation with a white person about it because I hadn't before. And I felt that in the same way I could have a conversation with Dennis about it, I'd like to feel comfortable about having a conversation with as many white people from, from Britain as possible and, and to feel open enough to go, this is the pain, this is the hurt, these are the contributions that we have made to this country that are not recognized or realized and why, uh, people are activists and why people are fighting hard for recognition because we know what we have contributed to this country. Um, so yes, that's how it began. We were both very, very passionate about it and he could see my passion and he said, let's, yeah. let's try to do something. Fantastic. Well, uh, we are also thankful that you did do something. <laughs> uh, Rose is one of our patrons. And so Rose, what does this project mean to you? 
Do you know, as uh, I listened to Michelle, the thought that was going through my mind was uh, this so-called celebration that we abolish slavery, totally um, negating the millions of people who were enslaved and who fought for their own freedom. And actually it, it, it was the reality of the financial non-viability and, and, and the fact that we were making it impossible uh, why they had to relinquish their hold or their grip. And, 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 and people like Olada Equiano who um, I'm sure influenced William Wilberforce and others, uh, you know, their names are never mentioned. And, you know, and this for me, the world reimagined gives the opportunity for us to bring to life the reality of what this has been, of what it was, what it is, and what it can become through the world being reimagined again with all our artistic abilities and actually the life of hope. And in that last a few lines of the poem that you read, one of my favorites, we are mm. the hope and the dream. Yeah. And, and we, we carry that hope. We carry that hope and we, we, we give it uh, to, we entrust it to our children and our grandchildren. So powerfully said. Thank you, Rose. I could not agree more. And one of the things that I encourage our artists to do is to grab a hold of this, regardless of your background you have a voice in this story. And one of the reasons why this particular session is called our shared history and collective strength is really that we have the power to move this conversation forward and move this history forward. Um, and, and we, regardless of our background, have this shared history. This is all of our history. This is not black history. This is not white history. This is a shared history. Um, so speaking of histories, I will give us a little time to talk about our personal histories because uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to have both of you two on today is it's three very different diaspora perspectives. Um, so I'll start with myself and uh, we can start the slideshow that we have. I'll just speak over it a little bit and then I'll, um, I'll pass it over to Gail to speak a little bit more, I'm sorry, Michelle, to speak a little bit more about her um, experience. So I am American, I'm third generation American, and my, um, you can go to the next slide, my, in this slide, you'll see on the left, my great, my grandmother, um, my great grandmother was from Barbados. So um, on one side, I have Caribbean roots. And then on the other side, on my dad's side, we can really just go as far as the South, um, the American South. And so for sure, uh, on both sides, my family would have roots in um, the slave trade and uh, as descendants of enslaved people. Uh, on the left here, I just uh, have a picture of my grandfather that I love because he was clearly going to some event and he's got his kinte cloth around his neck, which is such a uh, expression of pride. And he had never been to Ghana where kinte cloth is from, but it was a symbol of, I think, black joy and, and pride. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is where you see me with my parents. Um, again, these are all kind of personal family photos because this is a, uh, a personal conversation, but this is me at our, um, a debutante ball. So I'm from Oakland, California, which is um, in loose terms in the 80s, was definitely considered a black city. Um, it had a very large black population. And so there were many 
programs and um, events for young black people. This was a debutante ball and it was all for young black women. And it was our coming of age and a kind of old tradition that's traditionally associated with white Southern bells. And here, this is a West Coast, very modern version with, with young black women. Next slide. And you see here the, a graduation photo from London School of Economics with my mom. And then on the right, you'll see me at the, the protest, the Women's March um, in 2017 in Washington, DC. And the next slide. And then this, this last slide of me is of um, uh, actually at the White House and during uh, President Obama's term. And it's my family uh, standing in front of one of the first black um, artistic um, pieces of art in the collection of the White House. And so it is a particularly powerful moment where the acknowledgement of this history of art and culture is brought into the most iconic house in America. So we'll, I'll take it off from there and uh, hand it over to Michelle to talk a little bit about her background and where, um, where she grew up in, in London. Um, yeah, I grew up in Northwest London in Halsden, um, which was a real uh, melting pot. It was like, West Indians, Asians, and Irish. And we all lived side by side, cheek by jowl. And we kind of borrowed bits from culture. Like I still remember a bit of, bit of Gujarati because my neighbors had taught me Darren and Suche, but we, we still used to hang out with Irish people. We used to always, you know, they opened a mean fiddler, basically they opened a mean fiddler in Halston because the Irish community was large also. So um, it was, a it, it was, it was, a real mix of people, but I would say being black was quite at school. It was a, the dominant, you know, it was the dominant, uh, you know, the dominant amount of people were, were black. So when I'd gone to primary school, it was mainly black and, and you didn't really get any kind of sense of not belonging in that space in Holston. It's only little things. Like I remember my mom taking me to the butcher and she was, uh, something was on my face and she was wiping it and it's all white. But he went, oh, so the first person I heard say that. And at the time I was like, oh, shut up mom, stop going on about it. Cause you're so young and you want to know why she was so, just hammering a home Afrocentricity, how important it was. Um, so I knew about um, Ignatius Sancho when I was like six or seven. You know, my mom was teaching all that stuff really, really young. And it literally went like in and out because I just like, okay, 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 stop going on about it. That's how, because it was so normal to me that I didn't realize that so many people were deprived of that information. Um, so she set up this, in, this uh, uh, organization called Black Insight and she set up, a, she had a building and she used to teach um, local women how to do secretarial skills while she had a crash so that we could look after the kids while, while she taught people skills um, to get out into the workplace. And she used to always be fighting um, the local council uh, for more funding. So this is why I really, um, sorry, I really understand, you know, that grassroots level of fighting for money. My mom used to fight every single penny of funding. And I remember her once, one of my earliest memories was she took me to Brent Town Hall and there was a, I think the, the councillors were conservatives at the time, not that it matters anyway, but she sat me down and she said, wait there. And the next thing I knew, there was this Tory councillor talking and my mum barged onto the stage with some other <laughs> activists, started shouting them down. I was like, that's my mum, <laughs> you know. So she fought so hard to make Brent better and to make other black women um, further themselves. And I think a lot of that just kind of osmosis, isn't it? 
it goes into me. And so I've always been against injustice and I've always been against lies. I've always wanted to delve into the truth and the uncomfortable truth. And, I've, and, I've, and as I've got older, there was a middle ground when you realize, wow, people really don't wanna hear this. You know, people are really kind of shutting out um, conversations that need to be had. And that's why I said meeting Dennis was such a revelation to me to have a conversation with, a conversation I'd normally have with another black person. To have that with a white person was, was a first for me. Um, but now I do it all the time. I really engage in that and lean into that kind of, we have to talk. And that's why it was really important to me that this project is not about pointing fingers and saying, you know, because you always get the same old, I can't be blamed for what my great, 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 great granddad did. And it's like, no one's saying we're blaming you, but what we're saying is acknowledge the advantages you gained from what your great, 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 great granddad did. And let's have this conversation so we can move forward um, mm. it, as equals, as true equals, you know? Because as you said, it's our history. What yeah. your great, 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 great granddad did to my great, great, great granddad matters. Um, and it's about moving that conversation forward from, no, we're not pointing fingers. We're going to have a chat. Um, mm. And that's how the world reimagined was born really from that, from that ideal. Right. Well, I think also, yeah, if we can go to the next slide, I think also on, on this, um, on this, the flip side of this idea is that those, um, those things that happened in the past have legacies. And that's so right. we can't really move forward without addressing those legacies. And that's what in the journey of discovery echoes in the present really explores that, um, yes, this was legislated many, many, you know, decades and hundreds of years ago, but the reality is that there are still remnants of it. Um, I love these photos because these go back to your your singing career, yeah. and um, I will. I'll, I'll just. I just wanted people to have a visual image because I'll come back to to the power of music um, in Black culture a little bit later. But um, we can go to the next slide. And now we see Michelle in her glory. I love this photo. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the Afro. Yes. I love yes. it. Yes. Was that, that's part of the character or how did that come about? Because it's such a symbol of black women. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. I wasn't, I didn't, it was the first lady that, that played Numa. Um, who played um, Hermione, she did the workshops. And I think they were trying to work out this style for Hermione. And, and I'm, I'm speaking from what I've heard, but I've heard that Numa said, let's not let her have straight hair. Let's let her have black hair. Let her be empowered by that. Um, and it's, it's so wonderful to go out there um, in different forms of Afro and natural hair. And, you know, she's the leader and she's the boss. And, and you, you know the character of Hermione as being, you know, a really super intelligent, super um, altruistic character. And there she is with the Afro, you know, looking queenly and her crown, you know. Uh, yes. it, it is, um, it's such an honor to be able to play Hermione Granger as a, as a, a black woman with black hair. It, it matters, you know. It really matters. Mm. And again, I want to speak to our artists. This goes back to the idea of representation, which is very much what part of the world reimagine is trying to accomplish, to bring multiplicity into this discussion, to um, celebrate various parts of Black culture, which I, we'll get into a little bit more as we, um, as we talk about other themes in the journey of discovery. But I just, I, I appreciate you, Michelle, and I thank you for embodying that, that character. Thank you. Um, so we'll go now to Rose and uh, learn a bit more about your history, Rose, because you are from Jamaica originally, right? I am, I am. I was born and brought up in Montego Bay, Jamaica. And normally I say, when I introduce myself, that I was lucky to have been born and brought up in Montego Bay, Jamaica,
because growing up there as a child, I could see images of myself in all walks of life. You know, I walked down the, the road and in the bookstore, on the covers yes. of books, there were images that looked like me um, in the magazines, you know, so we were there. We were there in government, in polit politics, in religion, you name it, we were there. Now, my father, who you can see, I'm standing with holding his hand, uh, holding his left hand, and I'm standing outside uh, the little uh, mission church that I used to attend. Mm. My father was uh, born in Cuba and uh, his mother brought him and his four siblings uh, to Jamaica. And uh, they came at the time when there were all this heightened tension between uh, uh, America and, uh, and, and Cuba in relation to them holding um, whatever those things were. Uh, I can't remember the details of it now, but they, yes. they came. Pardon? No, no, I said, yes, go on. Okay. No, I was saying, that, was it the Bay of Pigs era? Yes, I, I, I think it was. It was, yeah, anyway. And, and so they, they spoke uh, Spanish and uh, his mother, I'm not surprised, his mother became mentally unwell. The stress of bringing up the five children by herself in a, in a strange place um, took its toll on her. So in effect, my father and his siblings brought themselves up. They grew themselves up because they had no other family in, in Jamaica. So they, they looked out for one another. And on the picture with where I'm, on, the, on my wedding day, the lady in the blue dress is my father's sister. And mm. she, she, I grew up with her. My mother came to the UK in the early 60s and apparently left me with my father. And my aunt, who you can see there, aunt's pet, said, and I'm going to say this in Pato now, this man can't even look after himself. I hope he'll look after picnic. <laughs> he can't even look after himself how on earth is he going to look after two small children and so she took us into her home and grew us up that's her husband on the other side of standing on the other side of me there so I I owe a lot to her my father didn't know what it meant to be a father but then I'm not surprised looking back now because he had no models of that, certainly coming mm. as a little boy to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I never heard my father say, I love you. But I can tell you what, he was very proud of us. Mm -hmm. He would boast. He would boast to the whole community. Femidata Gua High School. You know, he <laughs> He bragged about it, but he, he, he didn't know how to care for us, mm -hmm. etc. Et and it's only as an adult now, uh, you know, as I became an adult and as a Christian, reflecting on my life, that I realized this man did not have the means of, of, of looking after himself or knowing how to look after us. So we went through high school. I had an early call since I was 14 that I was being called to ministry, but being called to ministry in a church that did not ordain women as ordained leaders in the church. And so you can see me in the gray suit when I joined the church army, which was founded, an organization founded at the same time as the Salvation Army, which was why I think it was called Church Army. And it's an Anglican organization, but with lay people. So none ordained at the time. And, uh, and so I came to the UK to train uh, as a church army evangelist. And, and that was where I met my husband, who was a year ahead of me, and eventually went back to Jamaica to work, came back here to the UK eventually. And by then, women were now being ordained as deacons. So in that picture where I'm holding up that placard. This was a march we went on because the General Synod 
was discussing whether women should be ordained as priests. And, and I had a placard made up and, and went on the march to, to Church House in Westminster where they were um, discussing it. Women beautifully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And it, that was in 92, I think it was. And it was in 94 when women were first allowed to be priest, that I was priested in that first batch in my diocese of Litchfield. Can I just say, Rose, because this is a really important point. Um, when we look at the journey of discovery theme of abolition and emancipation, that this is really a continuum. And so we, when we look at your personal journey, we see that continuum of not being able to represent and lead in your yes. church to now being yes. the first black female bishop yes. in the Church of England. So um, it's a really beautiful message and it's very much what the world we imagine is about, this idea that that we are on this continuum and it's up to us to move this dialogue forward. Absolutely, and we have to, we, we cannot, when the world say no to us, we mm -hmm. have to have that yes inside us. So when yes. I first, when I came back here and first applied in for the process to become ordained, I was told that I ought to be at home looking after my husband and my daughter. And I remembered wow. at the time saying to them, my husband is perfectly capable of looking after himself, uh, you know, <laughs> so, so we have to yeah. persist yeah. Uh, and, and keep going. We have to stay resilient. It is very mm. costly, very costly, but for, the, for the, the sake of the generations to come, worth it. And, and, and that is me, I'm ordained as a priest and serving. And I had been, I had visited Ghana by then. And hence, ah. I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so connecting, connecting with mother country, as it exactly. were. And that, and that was amazing when I went to Ghana. Um, because not only did I go to the place where they uh, had kept people in, the, in those um, caves like structures, yeah. But, you know, and that was painful enough, but I was even more pained by the fact that a church had been built above. And, and, and I wrestled, how could they, how could they have worshiped above ground, knowing that there was humanity being shackled and kept in those conditions below ground? I think the church definitely lost its way then. You know, that's really powerful to hear you say that because as someone who didn't grow up with religion in our household, these were um, some of the, the frustrations that my you know, mother who um, is, is, has no religious practice felt that how could this be? So it's really interesting for her you know, who's not involved in the um, Church of England, and for you, who is involved, to, to, for two people with different backgrounds to be asking the same question. Um, and again, that ties us back to our shared history, our collective strength to question what is accepted. Yes, and our shared humanity. And our shared humanity. Yes, uh, this, uh, the wonderful Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, this was held in South Africa, La Alegre, in, sorry, not South Africa, in Brazil, Port Alegre, Port Alegre, um, where we were there for the, uh, the World Council of Churches meeting, and we were staying in the same hotel. So my claim to fame was that I was having a drink of pina colada and he'd never tasted that before and he tried mine. <laughs> but that was just, that was just wonderful to, to, to meet him, to sit next to him, to see this man who was hysterically funny, but a man with such depth, a man who we know had gone through so much pain, so many tried to dehumanize him and yet still, I rise, he yes. rose, 
he rose. And, you know, being with him for me was an, an example of the world reimagined that he did not allow others to define who he was, but he knew and he rose above. He did not allow them to, 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 to enable him to grow hate and become bitter. His spirit is joyful and his, his whole demeanor depicts joy and love and peace and, and, and gave himself working for that. And it was just such a blessing. There is an Old Testament story of the prophet Elijah and Elisha. When Elisha, the younger prophet said, I'm not going to, I don't want to be out of your sight until I get your blessing. And it felt a little bit like that, getting his blessing. Ah, oh, that's gorgeous. I love it. Well, one of the things I wanted to touch on before we move into our uh, question and answer from our audience is the idea of Black culture. So in our, in our themes, we talk about expanding soul. And this is really a theme that celebrates Black culture. And one of the things that is, is universal in any culture um, across humanity is music. And I think about the music you know, as an American, hip hop, jazz, blues. I think about reggae in Jamaica. I think about grime in the UK and all of these um, forms of art in black culture and how they've contributed to the larger culture and to mainstream um, America and, and the mainstream UK. And so I'm, I'm curious, um, Michelle in particular, as one of the people who is an, a singer and who is in the music industry, what is your relationship to that? And, and what do you feel that Black music has brought to the, the larger world? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> First of all, for me growing up, um, I'm one of the lucky people because I've got Jamaican backgrounds. So we loved, um, we love reggae music, right? We love Bob Marley. But when our own people start coming through, because we, we invented Love is Rock, in my opinion. We brought <laughs> Love is Rock to a next level. So to know that Janet Kay, who's from Northwest London, was like accessible to me, and to see her on top of the pops of Silly Games, I, I cannot express to you what that means, that someone from Northwest London can be number one in this country. It, it just meant, so much to us so even things like there was our, our song in Jamaica was passed to Coochie which is, which is a different type of pot but then the, the guys from um, Birmingham did um, pass to Dutchie on the left hand side and I think that got to number one so things like that really inspired you because you thought wow you know black British people are getting on top of the pots which was the number one show at the time but mm. I was also uh, so then I, I started thinking well I want to sing it I want to sing but how, how do you do that? How do you get on? You know, I don't do reggae. I, I, you know, you couldn't find a way through, but I, there were two uh, sets of people that I met that inspired me. When I was young, I don't know what, what I was doing. My mom didn't know where I was, but I was going to the Africa Center um, in Covent Garden and I saw Soul to Soul play. And I, Soul to Soul used to DJ, right? And they were just, I thought DJs. And I remember the day Jazzy B said, we've made a record because we were there at Africa Center. And we were like, how can you make a record? Like you play records. I remember it. And I remember Ooh. Rosie coming out and singing Fair Play. And I, and I genuinely thought at that point, anything's possible. Because, because here were people that we thought just played records. And yeah. all of a sudden Jazzy B created yeah a movement, funky dread, the image, the music. He took over America. We, I oh, want yeah. to be that close to something and to see it explode across the world. I can't tell you the strength and inspiration it provides you with. And I also knew Moni Love. And oh, to see wow. Moni Love go to America. Yeah. And she did. 
all of these things, even though I'm not doing rap, even though I'm not a DJ, all of these things make you think it's possible. It's possible and I've got to keep pushing. And I'm, I always say I'm one of those people who if someone's doing well, um, I'm not jealous, I'm inspired. I'm yes. inspired, you know, I dig deep. And these people paved the way to let you know that you, you can inherit who you are, the essence of you and still do well. Um, Jazzy B never compromised who he was at any point. He was always the same. I know him now. So he's the same Jazzy B I used to dance to as, um, as he is now. He didn't compromise. He just said, move out the way and this is me. And people lapped it up. And I, I really um, learned from that and thought, I'm going to not, probably the biggest talent I probably have is not giving up. But it's because of people like that that I don't give up. Because I've seen the impossible happen. It's different now because kids see uh, Stormzy and all. But at that point, you just were not seeing. It was always Black Americans. You to to yeah. see people that you knew make it, yeah. make you think anything's possible. Again, I love this story because it it just goes straight back to the world reimagined representation. Artist, I'm so in, you know excited for you to bring this representation into the public sphere, into the globes, into your designs, and for another small child or another teenager to come and see it and think, oh wow, I see myself in this globe, or I see myself in this story, regardless of what their background is. So that's that's the message that I really want to get across today. And, and I think music is one of the really powerful and extraordinary ways that we can look into this history, whether it's protest music. You know, when I think of Bob Marley and I think of the messages that were in his music, that was protest music. Uh, and um, when I think of hip hop and when I think of some of these other forms that are saying, no, we, we will stand, we still I rise and I celebrate myself. So I want to ask you, Rose, how do you celebrate yourself uh, as a human, as a woman, as a black person, as a Jamaican? What do you do to celebrate yourself? Mm, interesting question. Mm. Um, I, I, Perhaps if if I if I really think about it, that poem of Maya's "Phenomenal Woman," <laughs> mm. I love I I love it I love it "Phenomenal Woman." That's who I am. That's what I, I am. love it. <laughs> you know the sense she. I once heard her reciting a poem. No images. She does not know her beauty. She thinks her brown body has no glory, but if she could dance naked under the palm trees, then she would know. But there are no palm trees on the streets and dish water gives back no images. It's a poem by wearing Cooney. And, and, and for me, the, 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 the need for me to celebrate who I am is, I am a child of God. So those who say, I don't want you because you're black to, to, uh, to officiate at my, my parents' funeral or whatever, you know, I allow myself to feel the hurt of that rejection, but I don't stay there. I rise up from it because I think, yeah. Rose, you do a damn good funeral, girl. They are missing out, you know? I so this sense, <laughs> so this sense of, you know, I am a child of God. And, and as a child of God, then I am of value. And also mm -hmm. the fact that because I believe that we are all children of God, irrespective of color, culture, or creed, then it means I'm going to treat you as a person of value and, and treat with respect. And, and actually, I expect that as, as well. So my celebration of myself is a celebration that says, that begins with the fact that I'm a child of God and, uh, and, and, and worthy, worthy 
you know, God brought me into this world. I am worthy. And, and so I treat others with the same worth. I love the South African Ubuntu, Ubuntu. I am because you are our interdependence. And, and the world reimagined for me is uh, about that celebration, the reality that we belong together. And, you know, the, the, the songs by the rivers of Babylon, you know, because that's our song too, you know, and, and, and yes, we are going to sing, you know, we have a song and we are going to sing the, the, the song that we have. Um, and actually one of the, the wonderful things, you mentioned the different genres of, of music, but the spirituals, the spirituals, oh my goodness. Yeah. You yes. know, the spirituals, they take you down and they bring you yes. up and they rock yes. you from side to side. And, and you yes. can just go with it. You know, you can cry out, Lord, how come me here? And, you know, and you can just go with the flow. I wish when things are hard, I wish that I never was born. But then you can also have the joy you know, of Jesus walking with you. And so the music, as you mentioned, is very much part of the souls singing and, and daily. And part of that celebration is my soul singing. <laughs> oh, I love that. And that is the name of that journey of discovery theme, expanding souls. So um, perfectly said, thank you for that, Rose. I am going to go to some of the Q and A's that we have. We have the first one. What kind of visual arts or artists have moved or spoken to you with their work as a black woman? So I think the question is as a black woman, how have some certain artists moved you? Michelle, do you wanna start with that? Um, I think I've got a piece of art here. I I, I liked, um, I remember just going through it before I liked quite abstract art, so like Mark Rothko, things like that. I didn't know why it appealed to me. I just, I just knew it did. I think I discovered Rothko before I discovered Basquiat, actually, um, mm. because I was just really drawn to his, his paintings and Salvador Dali very early on, I remember being really drawn um, I don't know why, so I suppose it's some kind of mysticism, that quality um, yeah. that they had. Um, but then when, when I got a bit older, the first bits of art I actually bought were like of African people. Um, African, I don't know, I think it's up here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and, and there was a, a particular one I bought as well, which was, um, it was a cut out of African leather. So it was the shape of Africa, but it had okay. faces all within it. And I just, remember thinking how beautiful um, it was and the colors and to see the faces. And, and so those things moved me because they spoke of home, of, of familiarity, of, of and I may not be, you know, first generation born African, obviously, but I'm of African descent. And, it, and it's really weird how drawn I was in my first piece of art that I brought towards those images um, that I felt summed up cultural experience in some way. Oh, I think that that makes so much sense to me. I think it's, it's epigenetically in you to feel some sort of relationship with our first theme, Mother Africa. Uh, it's in you, even if you haven't experienced it, even if you've never been, um, even if you don't know the language here or, you know, in various different countries, because there's so many languages and there's so many countries, but to just know that that's a piece of you, which I think goes back to the image of the kente cloth that we see Rose in and we see my grandfather in that, you know, for Rose wrote that was actually from Ghana that she had received, but for my grandfather, he hadn't been. Um, he had been to other parts of Africa, but not Ghana. And yet that just felt like a symbol that he could relate to. And that felt like a celebration of, of his culture. When I was young, I was always really drawn to Egypt too. And I was always quite, mm. uh, I was always quite like, 
intrigued why people didn't kind of count Egypt as Africa. It always gets me like, hello, excuse me, that's yes. North Africa. And so it's, yeah. it's almost like they wanted to claim that they're Arab or Arabic or, you know. And then when I went to Egypt, the value they put on me, you know, they, they used to stop me in the street, Nubian sister, Nubian, <laughs> come here. And it was so nice to walk then and then like really worship you, you know, as a Nubian. Wow. And they used to negotiate special prices for me. And, um, and then I thought, so Egypt, it, Egyptians, when I met them, definitely count themselves as, as African, you know? And it, it's mm -hmm. because they were so advanced. It seems like people try to kind of pluck it outside of the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was very, very into Egypt very young and I, and I owned it as African from a very young age. Yes, I, I, I think, sorry, I was just going to very quickly say, for me, for me, it was the, the, the Black Madonna that from oh. seeing an image of the Black Madonna, mother and child, yeah. and, 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 and really connecting with it. Because, you know, when you were growing up, it, in almost every home that I knew of, there was an image of a white Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, sticking somewhere up there. And, 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 and yet, when I read scripture, <clears throat> and it speaks of, you know, God making us in his own image, that means God needs to look like me. And so white mm. people appropriated God and Christ, as it were, and, and it's about us reclaiming that. So again, the world reimagined, reclaiming that, you know, that we are in the image of God as well. And the art um, reflects that, is reflecting that is important. Absolutely. That's, and it's interesting that you bring that up because in our last masterclass, uh, Nicola Green, our, one of our principal artists, talked about the images of cherubs in uh, mostly religious art. And so how disappointed she was that there wasn't more diversity in this image. And so in her globe, she is going to explore cherubs of many different um, shades of skin. And I love that idea. I love, again, this rethinking, okay, let's move into the future. What do I want my to see? What do I want my children to see that, that cherubs and angelic children can be of any race or background? So um, I love both of everything that both of you have said. And I will just wrap up on a final question that I'd love to hear from both of you. What are your hopes for the world we imagine next year and its legacy? So, um, you know, we, I think both of you talked a bit about uh, what you hope the project does, but the legacy is a really critical piece. So what do you hope to bring with that legacy? Um, Michelle, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that um, it means that we all understand each other and can move forward as a nation um, mm. with who value the contributions that um, Black people have made to this country. Because it, it's it seems like you read today, don't you? Like you have to earn British citizenship, you know, as if it's some kind of um, prize that we have to scale some ladder to. It's like you know, I always say, um, black people put the great in Great Britain and we need to own it, you know, mm. we need to own it and, it and it needs to be recognized. Um, and, and I need to, when people ask me where I'm from, start going, my dad's from Jamaica, my mom's from Canada, <laughs> you know, because I don't feel right. British, you know, because you're not, mm. you're not really allowed to go proudly. I'm British and this is why, because this is what my forefathers did. To, to make this country great. And so I can own it, you know, um, and that's what I want to do. I want us to be able to collectively own the fact that black people as much a fabric of this nation as anyone else. Beautiful. I, I, I would love, I went somewhere recently and they had this little badge that says, I am human. I want every little black child to recognize their humanity and for others to recognize their humanity as well. But, but, but equally important, if we ended up with a legacy whereby everyone was allowed the space to be human, you know, to, 
allowed the space to be in that human space, that British space, that, you know, and that sense of belonging. There is so much going on, you know, and, and in particular, politically, a lot of stuff being thrown around about migrants and, and it, we, we all get caught up in it because of the color of our skins. You know, I would love one of these days, maybe even for an hour, every person with this color skin just stop working for an hour. My goodness, the buses wouldn't run, the trains wouldn't run, right. the hospitals right. wouldn't run. You name mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't run, you know? Yeah. And so just this, for me, the legacy that we're humans, this is where we are growing up, our children and our grandchildren are, and this is part of who we are. We are claiming it, we belong. We don't need someone to tell us that we are owning that and we are living it. And I want to be in that space, in that wonderful um, Hamilton song. I want to be in the room where it happened. You know, we're in the <laughs> yes. room. We're in the yes. room. And I want that <laughs> the world reimagined to be part of that legacy of us being in the room. <laughs> uh. Phenomenal. Thank you so much, Rose, Michelle. It has been a joy and an honor to sit here with you today. I want to thank all of our uh, audience members. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time. Artists, we are so excited to welcome you into this story, into this dialogue. Please Send in your open call submissions before December 31st. We want to represent your view. We want to represent your city. We want to represent what it means to be a part of this history. So send it in. Also, please visit our website, www.theworldreimagined.org. So we have a lot of announcements on the website. We have some job postings and uh, we would love for you to share that around uh, as well as sharing the open call. If you're not an artist, but you know an artist or know somebody who has something in them that can relate to this and that they can creatively bring that to life, then please pass it on, please engage. And lastly, I want to thank the World Reimagined team for all of their help today putting this event together and that you um, can watch this along with our other masterclass videos on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank Michelle. You. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.